I looked real silly in those. You do it all the time. Sometimes we just pass them back and forth. All right, I think we're ready uh, to go. And uh, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Everybody in the right class here? <laughs> You're here to encourage me. That's what it said, a better encouragement. That's what our class is all about. And so I'm going to begin by reading a text here in uh, Hebrews chapter 6. And we're going to begin at verse 13 and read to the end of the chapter and uh, kind of work our way through uh, this text. I'm using the New American Standard, if yours differs just a little from mine, because it's the one Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, he interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner before us, for us, having cut, become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Maybe uh, you're like me and like uh, the folks that are receiving this letter. Whenever you uh, experience difficulties in life, whenever you experience the trials that come our way, you might have thoughts of doubt and uh, kind of lose confidence. You might doubt the promises of God, and some people actually come to the point where they, act, they turn their backs on God. I've been preaching long enough that I've seen a lot of people do that. I remember standing next to an individual who uh, just lost uh, her mother, and uh, she was saying things, why did God uh, take my mother and things like that and how can I serve a God that would take my mother at such an early age and so you begin to lose your confidence and uh, you engage in these thoughts of doubt and I think that that's the situation that the author of Hebrews faces as he writes Christians who are about to let go he keeps telling them to hold fast your confession and hang on to your faith and the confidence that you have before God, but they're discouraged, they're weary, and they have endured a lot of persecution and a lot of problems with their lives, and they're weary of trying to be faithful to Christ and at the same time endure all of these tribulations brought about by those who oppose Christ. It may be that they're ex what they're experiencing is not what they expected when they chose to follow Jesus. And I've seen a lot of people think that once you become a Christian, life gets easier. They have that misconception that there'll be no more problems in life once you give yourself to the Lord. But of course, we recognize that that's not the case. Sometimes that brings even more difficulties to your life, but there is a sense in which life gets easier if you see the reality of what's going on and you, you have the perspective of Jesus. You see things as Jesus saw them and these little trivial things in our life, the troubles don't bother us like it does the world. I was reminded recently when we were burying my mother that 
we don't grieve like those who do not have hope. Oh, we grieve, and we still do, and we miss our parents, and, uh, and we experience those tribulations, but it's not like the world, because we see things differently, and we uh, have a whole different way of responding to the difficulties of life. When you add the new hardships of persecution to the routine hardships that everyone experiences, well, that can be quite a volatile mix, can't it? You can be, uh, you know, attacked from all sides, basically. And so some of these weaker Christians apparently are just saying, we've had enough, we can't take this anymore. Or as I've heard, uh, some people say, I don't need this. And so they just throw up their hands and quit. Well, the Hebrews writer is concerned that the people to whom he's uh, writing these words, they're about to fold. Some have already quit coming to church, chapter 10 and verse 25. They're abandoning the assembly. And of course, those that have remained behind, they're discouraged by that. I mean, dwindling numbers is always a discouragement. You probably don't experience it here in Linder Road. You're growing, and I've been in congregations where we grow, and that's always encouraging, but it gets a little discouraging when people are bailing for whatever reason. And so you see that happening among these readers. And so in the 13 chapters of this uh, great work by the Hebrews author, it's all written, all of it, is for the purpose of encouragement. He sees these people as apathetic. They're sluggish. They're dull of hearing. And uh, they've lost their confidence. And some are losing even their faith. And so they're letting go of the hope that was laid up for them. He calls this, in chapter 13, verse 22, a word of encouragement. And scholars are debating about well, what is this? Is this sermon notes, or is this a tract, or is this a letter, or what is it? And it, it's, it's all of that, isn't it? It's a word of exhortation, and exhortation has to do with urging people to do what's right, to not give up, to hang on, to keep on keeping on. And so that's what the whole letter is all about. It's all about encouraging. And he wants to encourage these faint-hearted brothers to not give up their hope but hang in and continue in faith. Now, I want to back up from where we just read and, and take two more verses, verses 11 and 12, that it sort of gives the author's intent regarding the readers. He says in verse 11, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Well, he desires that each one show the same diligence. I think he's talking about the diligence, that enthusiastic zeal, that hard-working kind of excitement that they once had. But they don't have that anymore. But he wants them to go back to that kind of diligence and that's why he's writing the, the letter or whatever we might call it. They're not as diligent as they once were. They've grown apathetic toward their religion. They're discouraged. They're down. And so everything the writer is putting on paper is for the purpose of waking them up and reclaiming their faith. And so he states the goal of his efforts here in verse 11 that he wants them to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. If you have full assurance, that means that you don't have any doubts. And so apparently the readers are experiencing some measure of doubt. I've been around long enough to know that whenever you doubt, that leads to inactivity. Why is it that you would not walk a tight rope across the Niagara Falls. Why would you not do that? Shouldn't everybody do that? 
No, you doubt that you could make it. And so that leads to inactivity. Thankfully. If you'll do it, I'll do it. But uh, I'm not going by myself. Uh, but it, it does that. Whenever I see inactivity among the Lord's people, I am looking at doubt. There's something going on where they don't have this full assurance, this great confidence that they're in a right relationship with the Lord and they know exactly where they're going when it's all done. And so the writer will, will give us a number of things about who Christ is and what Christ has done and he's doing all of that to build their confidence and their assurance in what they have. And he's helping them to see if you turn your back on that, there's nothing for you. Nothing. And so he reminds them over and over again about Christ and what he's done. In verse 12, he says he doesn't want them to be sluggish. And that's the same concept that he presented in chapter 5 and verse 11. But there it's translated dull of hearing. You become dull of hearing. But it's from the same Greek word. It means they're, they're not paying attention. They're not uh, listening to what God has said. And so that has led them to be very sluggish or slowed down. We use the word apathy, I think, in uh, the way that they approach their religion. They are down and out spiritually. And so the writer offers a kind of personal goal for these readers when he says here that they need to be imitators, this is verse 12, of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. He's saying that there are some folks who lived prior to his readers who made it. And they made it by means of faith and patience. He's urging the readers to follow the example. This is what you need, faith and patience. And we talked about faith yesterday, if you were in my class. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And so he talks about people in chapter 11 who live their lives by faith. They see things differently than everyone else in the world. They have this ability, because of what God has revealed to them, to see into the unseen realm where God himself dwells. And they are guided by that, so they live their lives by a different standard than everyone else in the world. And so you see it in people like Abraham, the great father of all the faithful, those who have genuine faith. Faith gets you through, but also patience. And this word patience means to hold out long without reacting or giving in whenever uh, the times can get tough in your life. We use the words endurance and uh, perseverance sometimes to uh, uh, translate this word. It's that keep on keeping on no matter what. So these are the two things, these are the twin sisters that we need to bring into our family, faith and patience, in order to deal with the troubles that we experience in life. Now, all of that prepares, I think, the readers to receive what he's giving us in our text beginning at verse 13. And the point here that he's emphasizing, I think, is in that expression in verse 18 where he says we have strong encouragement we have strong encouragement and I tell you Christians in every generation need the encouragement that the Hebrews writer is trying to give his generation I know I need it in my generation and I think in every generation we all must have strong encouragement and so what was written to encourage those Christians to hang on is, I think, exactly what we need to hang on. And we have to experience and to exhibit that faith and patience. So he uses the example of Abraham 
who is one of those who had great faith and patience. He's one of those that should be imitated by all of us. And I, I want to note two things this afternoon about this better encouragement. So I'm just going to make two points for you. And one is uh, that we are encouraged by God's promise and oath. That's verses 13 through 17. And then secondly, in verses 19 and 20, we're encouraged by Jesus as a forerunner. So looking at 13 through 17, we're encouraged by God's promise and oath. And here he talks about Abraham. He gives us the example of Abraham in verses 13 through 15. And he talks about this promise that was made to Abraham. And we all realize uh, this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, doesn't it? Where God told Abraham that he would bless him with, uh, as the father of a great nation of people. And then others, all the families of the earth would be blessed through him. And that's a promise, of course, that includes us. We're part of all the families of the earth that would be blessed with Abraham. And so we sort of perk up when we hear that because we see ourselves among the heirs of Abraham and that promise that was given to Abraham. The long-reaching promise was us. It has to do with us when he gave the promises to Abraham. It's a spiritual promise. It has to do with the forgiveness of sins. And ultimately, it has to do with eternal uh, life with God. And it's fulfilled in anyone who possesses the same kind of faith as Abraham. We become the son of Abraham, the children of Abraham, the heirs of Abraham, the promises of Abraham, if we have the same kind of faith that he possessed. Now, the text says that God added something to these promises to Abraham and he added an oath and that's kind of interesting to me the concept of swearing here is to give an oath which was customary in those days if you wanted to shore up what you said and make sure that they knew that you were firm in what you were saying then you would take an oath you would swear to something and that oath would say, you can count on what I am promising you, what I'm saying to you. So if you had uh, promised something as being true, then the, the oath just sort of, uh, you know, clinched that so that folks could be confident about the promise uh, and it would be fulfilled. Now, in the, in the New Testament, in the first century, uh, Jesus, of course, confronted some people who had some problems with swearing. And uh, they were the religious leaders. They had devised a way whereby they could swear to something and then later get out of it. And you see this in Jesus' teaching in Matthew uh, chapter 23, where the, the scribes and Pharisees, they'd swear to something by the temple. And then later they would say, oh, well, I didn't swear by the gold of the temple, just by the temple. So, you know, it doesn't count. Or they'd swear by the altar, but not by what was sacrificed on the altar or something like that. And so they would devise ways to get out of keeping their word. And that's when Jesus said, you got to say yes. Well, that's yes. And when you say no, well, that's no. But God used the elements of man by securing what he was promising to Abraham by swearing. I remember when I was a kid, you know, you couldn't trust your brother at all. Uh, you know, he'd say you something, but every once in a while he'd say, I swear, this is the truth. And when he did that, then I knew, well, okay, he's doing it. And sometimes we say, I swear on a stack of Bibles or something like that. We do the same thing, don't we? And, and what we're saying is you can count on my word. This is what I said and this is what I mean. And I will pledge myself to that. In verse 13, you have the oath really presented. But I'm going to turn back to Genesis chapter 22 
If you can hold your place there, I want you to see this. Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 <clears throat> through 18. Genesis is in the Old Testament. And it's on page 17. Well, verse 15, the angel of the Lord came to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now this is right after uh, Abraham was offering up Isaac as a sacrifice. Since because of that, God added this oath and he swore by himself. So he made uh, the promise to him and he wanted uh, uh, him to understand that it was indeed going to happen, so he added an oath, swearing by himself. Well, in verse 15, back in Hebrews chapter 6, that presents the result of the example of Abraham because the writer says that Abraham patiently waited. He patiently waited. He believed the promise of God, the oath of God, and then he patiently waited. And that means that the promise that was made to him was not immediately fulfilled. In other words, there would be some time intervened before the promise that God made actually was realized by Abraham. And it, it suggests, when you use that word patiently, it suggests that there were some trouble, there's some hindrances to his hanging in there to realize the promise. There might have been some occasions where he could have doubted what God said. But instead of getting, giving up, losing his faith in what God promised and the oath, he patiently, he endured, he persevered until the reality actually occurred. And there were hindrances to Abraham's believing and trusting in God. There are a lot of things that, that tried him and tested his faith. They were too old. There's that Ishmael, and would Ishmael be the inheritance? And the sacrifice of his son Isaac, all of those things, that would test your faith, but he endured. And so the, the writer is saying that it took both genuine faith and a di diligent perseverance for Abraham to obtain the promise. That means it was fulfilled. Abraham received everything that God promised him. He was the father of a great nation of people. He was blessed and his enemies were cursed. And now he's the father of a great spiritual nation of people and all the families of the earth are blessed because of Abraham holding on by faith and perseverance to what God promised. So in verses 16 through 18, here's the application that the writer makes for his readers and for us. He begins by helping us to see that the oath is always solid confirmation of whatever is promised. When men swear he says it's always by one greater than themselves. And often, of course, men swear by God. We'll sometimes say, as God is my witness, or if you, it used to be, when you went into a court of law, so help you God, they used to say, when you put your hand on the Bible. And there's a reason for that. When you evoke the, invoke the name of God in an oath, then everyone listening are given encouragement that you're telling the truth. Because you would not use God's name in, in such a way lightly. 
And so when, everyone, when someone takes an oath like that to confirm that they're saying it is the truth, the writer says that's the end of every dispute. No one is going to argue about whether or not the oath taker is telling the truth because no one lies under oath. And the reason for that is it's perjury and uh, the laws against perjury in the Old Testament were extremely severe and they are severe even in our land today. Even though some people will do that, generally speaking, that sort of ends all the argument. He is telling the truth because he was willing to take the oath. And that's what God condescended to do for us in order to shore up that promise in our minds in order to give us full assurance so that we have no doubt. And so the writer wants his readers to, to know that God showed this is verse 17, the unchangeableness of his purpose, so he interposed, he added an oath. What is God's purpose? What is his purpose? I think a lot of people who have been created by God don't get it. They don't know why they're here. And they don't realize that the purpose of God was in his mind before he ever said, let there be light. God has a reason for creating heaven and earth. God has a reason for giving you existence. And I think the Hebrews writer brings that out in chapter 2 and verse 10 where he says, God is wanting to bring many sons to glory. And so he perfected the author of our faith and that's Christ Jesus the one he sent Jesus in order to accomplish that and so his whole purpose going all the way back before the beginning was to bring us into relationship with him God is love God wants objects of love God wants to give love and to receive love and that's what it's all about and so through Abraham and the promises made to Abraham, he's going to bring many sons to glory. He's going to have these heirs that he will love and they will love him. And so we are among the heirs of promise, as the writer indicates here, the promise that God gave to Abraham. We are the spiritual aspect of the promise of the inheritance that God wants. And so in going back to the promising and swearing to Abraham, the writer is saying that all of that was done, all of that was written down in order to show us that God would not change his mind about the inheritance, about bringing us into a relationship with him. If you've got God's word on it, you can have full assurance without doubt. Verse 18, the writer is saying that the way God went about securing the inheritance gives us strong encouragement. The two unchangeable things mentioned there are the promise on the one hand and the oath on the other. Whatever God promises is unchangeable. And of course, as with men, whatever God might swear to, that also is the truth, isn't it? And so by those two unchangeable things, we have this strong encouragement. It comes from uh, having certainty that heaven is ours. We have no reason to doubt that we are going to be in heaven. It doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on our perfect, holy nature in that sense. It is always on God and his promises and the oath that he took and so when we hang on to the promise and the oath we're going to be encouraged we're going to have assurance and we're not going to doubt we're never going to doubt now when things are going well for you you're confident it's when things aren't going well for you that 
you begin to have thoughts of doubt and you're not as assured. But if you can actually have certainty and you know without any question that you have the inheritance, nothing, nothing will deter you. I like using an illustration that I used many years ago. It's sort of like me getting a phone call from New York City. Uh, is this Guy Orbison? Yeah, this is Guy Orbison. Well, I'm a lawyer in New York City. And uh, do you remember having an Uncle Tom, Tom Johnson, in your family? I'd say, no, I, I, I don't remember uh, Tom Johnson. Well, he is a, an uncle twice removed in your family, and he's passed away. And uh, he's left you, he named you in his will, and you have $40 million. Oh, Uncle Tom, I miss him already. <laughs> oh, my. Terrible, terrible thing. Well, Mr. Arbison, all you have to do is, is just come on up to New York and uh, we'll give you the check. Would that be all right, Mr. Arbison? Mr. Arbison? You see, I'm already gone. <laughs> I'm headed to New York because I got $40 million waiting for me. And, you know, I forgot to pick up my wallet and I run out of gas. And then do I just throw up my hands and say, oh my, it's, I don't have any gas. I think I'll just quit. No. I've got $40 million waiting for me. I'm out there with my thumb doing this. And I'm hitching a ride. And after a few days of that, when I haven't bathed, people won't pick me up anymore. Do you think I'm going to quit? No, I've got $40 million waiting for me. And so I'm walking. And then the soles of my shoes wear out. And I'm back on my feet, so to speak. You're the only one that got that. I throw them out there and people dodge them all the time. Do you think I'm going to quit just because I'm barefoot? No. When you have assurance, you're not going to doubt. You're not going to let anything hinder you from reaching your goal. That's what the writer is saying here. That's Abraham. And that's what he understood. And so in verse 18, the writer includes himself with the readers when he says, We who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope before us. There's a hope before us. Hope just means confident expectation. We know we're going to receive it. And so we have run and fled for the refuge that the Lord offers us in holding out that hope to us. We were like drowning in a sea of sin, and Jesus is our life preserver, and we grabbed hold for dear life because of what he offers us. That strong encouragement. But here's point number two. We're encouraged by Jesus entering as a forerunner. And the point of verse 19 is that our hope, that's our confident expectation, is what anchors us now. An anchor is something that keeps you from drifting. My very first work as a preacher was in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, Roseville, one of the suburbs of St. Paul. And some of the men wanted to take me fishing. I wasn't a fisherman. They had a few lakes there, 10,000 of them. And so uh, they said, we're going to go camping and fishing, and we want you and Mary to come too. And, and so it was about eight or ten families went together and camp. I said, you know, I can't go. I don't have a tent. I don't have an uh, RV, anything like that. Oh, you stay with us. And so um, I stayed with another couple who had one of those pop-ups, you know, 
and uh, there were two, three families in there, counting Mary and me, and they, when you folded it out, there was a bed on one end and another bed on the other end. They got those. And, and then you got the middle floor, and that's where Mary and I slept. And, the, and the, the thing was not square, and so the door kept opening up. And so it was my job to keep the door closed, and so we'd have to tie that off. But that's not where I'm going with this story. It just came to mind. Anyway, I was up all night closing the door. Well, the next day we went fishing, eight of us in a boat, and one of the elders had the boat, very proud of it, and, and rightfully so, it was a nice boat. And man, we went out, and he said, this is the spot. He, you know, he had been on every lake, I guess, in Minnesota. He knew the spot. And he said, Guy, there's an anchor under your seat. If you'll uh, throw out the anchor and anchor us here, we'll fish here. I said, fine. So I found the anchor, threw it out. And we're all fishing. Pretty soon we're drifting. He said, Guy, did you tie off that anchor and throw it out? <laughs> tie it off? <laughs> so the next hour, he had me rowing us around looking, hoping that rope, that nylon rope would float to the top so we could find his favorite anchor that he's had for so long. <laughs> but I learned a valuable lesson there. If you're not anchored, you're going to drift, aren't you? And that's what the writer is saying here in using this anchor imagery because these people are starting to drift away from what God promised. And they're not anchored from what God wants us to have. And the anchor is the hope, that confident expectation that he's laid before us receiving what God wanted for us. And so we have a spiritual anchor. It keeps us from going adrift during the storms of life. And when, maybe you've seen movies where they lash, in, in, you're out on the ship, uh, you know, and there's a big storm, and they lash themselves to the mast or something. They're anchoring, so they're not swept overboard. And so they, it's that anchor means of keeping us from drifting away and being lost forever. And there are two things here in verse 19 about the anchor. First, he says it's sure and steadfast, which means it's tied off securely. And if you're attached to that anchor, you're not going to drift because it's tied off securely. But note, secondly, where it's anchored, it's within the veil. And I think that's significant. The mention of the veil takes your minds back to the tabernacle or the temple and the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And the writer expounds on that in chapter 9, and I talked about that in class this morning. But he's talking about the very place where man and God were assigned to meet. And there, there's a sense in, in the old tabernacle where God condescended to meet man there, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The Holy of Holies was really a representation of heaven itself. And so to enter within the veil is to go into heaven itself and to anchor us there, where God actually is. We've been anchored there. And so in verse 20, the point is that the, the one who's anchored us gives us great encouragement. The writer is saying here that Jesus entered that veil and he did that to tie off the anchor or to anchor us to that hope, the hope that we have. And so he's a forerunner for us. And I love this word forerunner. And it means one who runs ahead. It's used in, in some of the secular writings in ancient Greece of a warrior that went out ahead expecting all of the soldiers to follow him into battle. And a forerunner is someone that goes out ahead. And you have the same concept in, in chapter 12 and verse 3 with the word author there in the New American Standard. It's really the word trailblazer. And you see the same thing in chapter 2. In verse 10, the same word is there. 
It's the idea of someone who's gone ahead of us, but he expects us to follow. And so Jesus led the way, and he anchored us in heaven, and uh, he's thrown down the ropes uh, to, for us to grab hold of and be anchored to our hope. Our hope is the anchor in heaven. Now that reminds me of a John Wayne movie. Doesn't it you? I mean, doesn't it really just, you think about it. I know you're thinking about it. In The Longest Day, which was about, you know, D-Day, and we're taking Omaha Beach, and uh, these guys, there's these cliffs, you know, and the Germans are shooting down on our guys, and they have these, well, I call them rope cannons, where they shoot them up, you know, and they got a grappling hook, and, and they're supposed to grab hold of something, and then the, you could climb up the cliffs. Well, they didn't grab. Some of them didn't. And so a man would take that, and he would climb up the cliff and then anchor that grappling hook, and then all the other soldiers could climb up the rope. Well, that's what Jesus did. He went up first. He anchored it. We have the other end, and we're holding on, anchored uh, in uh, heaven itself. It's within the veil. And so we can come within the veil. Jesus has become our high priest, and that's why he's able to enter into the true holy of holies in the very place where God is. And he's there for us, having anchored us to that. And we now patiently wait until we obtain the promise and while we're doing that he functions as our high priest effectively dealing with our sins we're to follow Jesus and Jesus has removed the veil symbolically when he died the veil was torn from top to bottom wasn't it God is saying Okay, it's open. My son opened the door. You can come in. You have access to me. We can actually come to the mercy seat ourselves and find the mercy that we need. The problem that concerns the writer here is that these readers are drifting because some of them have let go of the rope they've let go of the anchor and so they've given up on their hope and the reason for this is they have begun to doubt they don't have the full assurance they've neglected the word of God which helps to keep us anchored they're spiritually dull of hearing and sluggish as a result of not listening to God anymore they're apathetic they're discouraged and so he writes all of this to say, keep on. Don't let go. Let me see if I can visualize what I hear the writer saying. One day the, the Lord appeared to Abraham. He made a promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you the father of a great nation of people. And in, in you, all the families of the earth will ultimately be blessed by me. Can you see that, Abraham? Can you see yourself as being the father of a great nation of people? And Abraham says, I think so. And God says, well, let me firm that up for you. I'm going to swear by myself that this is going to happen to you. And I want you to, to, to know for certain that I'm going to make you that father. And so I'm going to anchor you to the future, the unseen future. I'm going to tie off this rope there, and there's two ends of the rope. It's my promise, and it's my oath. And if you hold on to my promise and to my oath, 
you're going to be anchored to the future that I have in store for you. I know you can't see it now. And it's going to be a while. So Abraham, hold on to the promise and the oath. And Abraham said, yeah, I see it. And so he grabbed hold of the two ends of the rope. His wife, Sarah, came up and said, Abraham, what are you doing? What's that in your hand? Abraham smiled and he said, I've got the promise of God and the oath of God. Well, you got two ropes. What's on the other end? I can't see that far. He said, there's a multitude of people. My descendants. Your descendants, she said. She laughed. You don't have any kids. And you're too old to have kids. And Abraham said, have you looked in the mirror lately? Huh? <laughs> but he began to think, wow, she may have something there. I'm going to ask the Lord about that. And so the next time the Lord came around, he said, Lord, what about this age thing? Hey, Sarah's way too old to have kids. How can I have a multitude of people as heirs when I don't even have a son and she's too old? And the Lord said, well, what's in your hand, Abraham? Well, I've got your promise and I've got your oath. Hold on, Abraham. Don't let go. And so his grip tightens. Sometime later, Sarah came by and she said, you still holding on to that promise and oath? And he said, yeah, I am. She said, I've been thinking maybe the Lord intended for you to have a younger wife. And Hagar, my handmaiden, she's a lot younger. You could marry her and she could give you an heir. Abraham said, say, that may be it. And so Ishmael was born. Now Abraham is really excited. He can hardly wait till the Lord returns. And when the Lord comes back, he said, Lord, look, Ishmael, Ishmael. I can see it now. I'm going to be the father of a great nation of people. Ishmael. And the Lord said, the promise will not be fulfilled in Ishmael, Abraham. You won't have an inheritance there. But Lord, if I'm too old, and if Ishmael is not the means, then how in the world am I going to be the father of a great nation of people? What's in your hand, Abraham? Well, I've got your promise, and I've got your oath. Hold on, Abraham. Don't let go. Time passes, several years. Sarah comes back and she says, Hey, Abraham, are you still holding on to those two uh, uh, pieces of rope? I sure am. I've got the promise of God and the oath of God. She said, Well, you better hang on to your hat. You're not going to believe this. <laughs> and Isaac was born. Now Abraham is really excited because here he knows is the heir. Here he knows is the promise of God. Here he knows is the means by which the great nation will come. And so the Lord comes back and he says, Lord, Isaac, I never doubted you, Lord. I knew all the time it would happen. You see, I've held on to your promise. I've, I can see the great nation at the end of these ropes. And the Lord said, take Isaac up the mountain sacrificing here's where it gets weird Abraham said okay no problem you see he is firmly attached to the promise and the oath and he realizes now he does not see exactly how God is going to fulfill it but he knows without doubt that he's going to fulfill it and he obtained the promise. 
faith, perseverance, promise, hope. And so we have strong encouragement by these two unchangeable things, the promise of God, the oath of God. And so one day, the Heavenly Father was talking things over with the Son. He said, do you see what's going on down there in the earth that I created? Those people are, are struggling. They're drowning in sin. Son, I need you to go down there. I need you to help them. I need you to save them. I want you to tie this rope around your waist, and I want you to go down there and offer it to, to all those people. And whoever grabs hold of the ends of those ropes, whoever attaches themselves to you, we're going to save them because I want you to come back after you've done that. And let's tie that off here inside the veil and anyone who has hold of those ropes will be anchored to us and to eternity what keeps us from drifting from our hope is that anchor the anchor and holding on by means of faith and perseverance all of the storms of life will not set you adrift when you have a firm hold on the anchor. You grab hold by faith, you hold on by perseverance. And we're following the example of Abraham when we do that. We have strong encouragement. There is not a reason to doubt there's never a reason to let go. Hold on. Hold on. Thank you for your attention today.